In 1907, the New Haven Railroad proposed merging with the Boston and Maine as the Northeastern Railroad was expanding northward and purchasing nearby railroads and streetcar lines, thanks to banking from J.P. Morgan. The first transfer of ownership was to a steel company by the name of Larry of Steel and Trading. But a few days later, the locomotive would find itself with more of its buddies at Northwestern Steel and Wire and was simply numbered down to 05. For four years, Ross held the idea of a steam-powered exhibition train about most of the major accomplishments of the 20th century before the next century hit the world. Clinchfield's SD40T-2 Tunnel Motors There was a plan for Clinchfield to acquire tunnel motors in the 70s when Southern Pacific and Denver and Rio Grande Western were doing just that. Clinchfield noticed how incredible they were in the mountainous terrains of Cajon Pass on the Southern Pacific and the Rockies on the Rio Grande. So the Clinchfield thought, we need them for the Appalachian routes. And so they placed an order for around 25 of them to be built by EMD. Unfortunately, it came at the worst time. The seaboard system absorbed the Clinchfield Railroad in their system, and the order was ultimately cancelled. American Steam Locomotives Breaking Mallard's Speed Record During and After World War II I wouldn't be really surprised if steam locomotives broke Mallard's record multiple times during the war, but after though, I have my doubts. One of the main examples of this would be the Pensy T-1, which claimed to reach up to 140 miles per hour on multiple occasions during their career. The reason why I'm more hopeful about Mallard's records being broken during the war is simply because it was a fast-paced, action-packed time for the world. Supplies like tanks, ammunition, and food needed to get out to the European and Pacific theaters as soon as humanly possible, and the trains were just the ticket for speedy delivery across the country. Afterwards, I think America calmed down and didn't go as fast as they did during World War II. So a select few did claim to go 126 miles per hour and more. Union Pacific was storing the CNW twins at the Illinois Railway Museum. This is sadly not true. However, the CNW twins did visit the Illinois Railway Museum in 2010 and 2012 for special events. There were massive theories about the long-term storage of the two, even possible donation to the IRM. But those turned out to be faked in short order. CNW 8701 was repainted and renumbered to UNP 9805, and CNW 8646 got the same treatment, although renumbered to 9750. And since they haven't been seen for three years, it's safe to say that both units have likely been retired. Steam Fest at Spencer Rumors have circulated that, shortly after the Streamliners at Spencer event, the North Carolina Transportation Museum was contemplating doing an event similar to the Streamliners event of steam locomotives. So the story goes, the museum backed out of doing it and didn't get beyond discussions amongst museum volunteers because they thought it wouldn't be popular. That reason alone makes this hard to believe, though a more believable reason would have been because of how expensive it would have been to bring enough visiting the steam locomotives to make the event worthwhile. However, with the large number of large steam locomotives that are being restored around the east coast, that may become more feasible in the future with locomotives like Chesapeake and Ohio 1309, Buffalo Creek and Gully No. 4, Atlantic Coastline 1504, Chesapeake and Ohio 2716, RJ Corman 2010, Nickel Plate Road 587, Reading T1s 2100 and 2102, Boston and Maine 3713, and Maine Central 470. The NYC Hudson New Build Trust Ah yes, the New York Central Hudson. Considered one of the greatest locomotives of all time, it shouldn't be surprising to hear about a group proposed to build another member in the famous J3 class. In the early to mid-2000s, there was the potential of a new NYC Hudson being built from the ground up. This program would be under the banner named NYC Hudson New Build Trust. But sometimes things aren't the way that they seem. Sometime after the project was announced, no news came of the project's advancements. No materials, no plans being acquired, nothing. And people's hopes and dreams of seeing this legend return were diminished once more. 
The English electric Deltic being sold to the North American market. One of the most revolutionary locomotives which English Electric produced was the DP-1, or Deltic. Its striking color scheme and large headlight on the prototype were intended to demonstrate its suitability for export to North America and the British Commonwealth. These ambitions were never realized and were probably not even remotely realistic in 1955, given the complexity of the design. Much of the Deltic's construction was based on early American diesels like the Alco PA and the EMDE unit. Even a Mars light was predicted to be put on the locomotive, but that aspect of the locomotive was ditched. A German diesel hydraulic locomotive in the Carolinas. In the 1970s, Trains Magazine featured a short article with photos showing a German-built diesel hydraulic locomotive working at an industry somewhere in the Carolinas as it was shown meeting a Southern Railway freight train passing on the main line. Not much more is known, but the diesel locomotive was a center cab design, specifically a DR Class V100. It's unknown if this locomotive still exists, but it's probably been scrapped by now. PRR E7-4206 at the Indiana Transportation Museum According to the September-October 1972 issue of Extra 2200 South, it is reported that at one point the Indiana Transportation Museum briefly owned Penn Central, ex-Pennsylvania Railroad, E7 number 4206, but had it sold for scrap, presumably because it was in bad shape. To be fair, in those days, it was probably taken for granted as while the E7 was still fairly common, but disappearing fast. Today, there is only one surviving example of an E7, specifically PRR 5901 at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasbourg. Secondhand U.S. and Canadian locomotives moved to Mexico. Now, if this entry would be referring to modern Class 1 storage purposes, then that's definitely interesting. It may be concerning the more southwestern roads like KCS, BNSF, and Union Pacific and various smaller railroads if they chose to store their locomotives in Mexico. But it would definitely make for a change in scenery seeing all these American locomotives being stored in lines near the Mexico-American border. Definitely would be interesting. The Sunset Limited derailment from the 1990s. Another derailment caused by sabotage. This one was the 1995 Sunset Limited derailment, killing one and injuring 78 passengers and crew. On October 9, 1995, the Sunset Limited, a train running between Los Angeles, California and New Orleans, Louisiana, derailed outside the small town of Palo Verde, Arizona. The train was led by P32-8BWH511 and F40PHR398 as well as 12 cars eight of which would derail and plunge 30 feet into the dry riverbed below. The only person killed was a man named Mitchell Bates, who was a sleeping car attendant. The saboteurs have not been identified as of the making of this video, but they were part of the famed crime group Sons of the Gestapo. Footage from 1979 or 1980 of Northwestern Steel and Wire. On August 7, 2017, a small archival channel with nearly 5,000 subscribers by the name of Railroad Media Archive uploaded an 11 minute and 23 second long video titled Northwestern Steel and Wire Steam Railroad, Sterling, Illinois, 1979. The video is just what this century needed. The film was recorded by a man named Paul Geiger who is the second user with the most films on the RMA channel, with 77 films in total. The person with the most films in total, with 133 videos, is Todd Miller. This footage is likely the last taken of these rare switchers in service before being retired a year later. Footage of Southern Schools class Repton in steam during its time in the United States. Mark 1 video made a program several years ago about the Canadian Pacific G class specifics, with the emphasis being on 2317, and there is a very brief clip of Repton sitting in a siding somewhere near Scranton, in steam and being overtaken by CPR 2317. The program paid no attention to the clip on screen, as the focus was on Steamtown and CPR 2317. 
This is the only known footage of Repton in steam when it was here in America. There's bound to be more footage of it just sitting in Scranton Yard but not running, or even in steam for that matter. Penn Central New Building of Pennsylvania Railroad T1 and New York Central Hudson Before the New York Central Hudson New Build Trust and the T1 Trust existed, there was Penn Central, ready to serve the rail fans of America in a two-in-one special, a new build Penn CT1 and a New York Central J3. Did this plan fully pan out? No, it didn't. As per rail fan knowledge, the Penn Central was doomed from the start, not earning a single profit from the first quarter it was in service. So when this expensive program was announced, people had their doubts. The idea for PC Steam was scrapped quickly, as the railroad was focusing on trying to stay afloat after declaring bankruptcy only two years after forming and trying to compete against the trucking industry. Lehigh Valley Reading Central Railroad of New Jersey merger, 1971. Three bankrupt railroads, one major region served, one goal, to survive. That's what could have made this relatively unknown merger work. But for an unknown reason, most likely the ICC, the plan fell through and the merger didn't come to fruition. Even though the three railroads were intertwined with each other, its nearby trackage in the New Jersey and Pennsylvania regions could have been viewed as anti-competitive. All the railroads in the once prosperous Anthrakite region would survive under bankruptcy protection until the formation of Conrail by the U.S. government. Five painfully hard years of struggling to hold up, and the government eventually came to aid the struggling Anthrakite railroads of Pennsylvania. The Narrow Gauge Grand Trunk System Around the 1870s, 11 narrow gauge railways decided it would be best to be best buddies as Seaboard Rail fan puts it, and help each other out. This list is as follows. Cairo and St. Louis, Cleveland, Delphos and St. Louis, Houston, East and West Texas, Indianapolis, Delphi and Chicago, Kansas and Gulf Short Line, Mexican National, Texas and St. Louis, Texas and Mexican, Texas Western Narrow Gauge, Toledo, Cincinnati and St. Louis, and Toledo, Texas and Rio Grande. The H, E, and W, T, M, N, T, M, and T, W relied on the T and S, T, L to ship their goods from Texas up to Indianapolis to connect up to the Grand Trunk Western. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. During the panic of 1883-84, all of them experienced multiple bankruptcies and closed the following year. Most of them were standardized and only two to three of them tried to stay afloat but failed. The last to close was the Texas at St. Louis Railroad. But there's another context for this century. Shortly after the new Grand Trunk station was finished in Toronto in 1878, George Laidlaw, a local wharfinger, suggested that it would be cheaper for the line to be narrow gauge. The Toronto and Nipissing took note of this idea and contacted the Grand Trunk to place a third rail to connect up to Toronto. The Grand Trunk obliged, and the road's right-of-way ran all the way east alongside the Grand Trunk until Scarborough, turning north on its own way. Another narrow gauge railway, the Toronto Gray and Bruce, was built opposite of the TNN but wouldn't serve Union Station. Unfortunately, these narrow gauge systems do not survive today. Erie Railroad K5 Pacific in Korea Between the years of 1969 and 1970, the Korean National Railways had to deal with increased traffic and as such, had to bring back steam. One such engine was donated to KNR to help with the traffic, Erie K5 number 2524. But somehow, after KNR got the traffic control down, the locomotive went missing. Although people have gone looking for it, people have concluded that the locomotive was scrapped after the help was needed. There was somehow a report of the locomotive in service in 1984 or 1985, but multiple people have said that it was a misleading report. It is possible that the locomotive could still be in one of the Koreas. I don't think it would likely be located in the south, and as for the north, I'm not sure if anyone knows. Preserved locomotives and rolling stock which have been scrapped, but gone unnoticed. The creator of this iceberg, Dorax the Rail Fan, has a page dedicated to locomotives and rolling stock which was quietly lost in preservation. Some of these include Grand Trunk 6407, Virginia 173, and CNJ 774. In addition to this list, I would like to add a rail car which I have seen in person at the Rail Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg. PRR Pioneer 3 numbers 246 and 247. These two silver liners were scrapped in 2013 with almost no notice due to a trade for another silver liner, which unfortunately didn't happen. Thankfully, I have extremely old photos of the front of this rail car all the way back from 2012, not expecting to use it for this example of a lost silver liner. 
Illinois Central's Lost Steam Powered Streamliner. There are a few images of a streamlined black and brown Illinois Central 462 number 1146. The engine has a simple semi streamlined design with shrouding with the words Illinois Central Railroad on its side and the railroad's green diamond logo on its front. It is noted in an Illinois Central roster that this sole streamlined steam locomotive of the railroad pulled the St. Louis section of the Panama Limited to New Orleans. Another photo shows the same locomotive in its unstreamlined form, indicating that this was likely an experiment carried out by the Illinois Central. Unfortunately, this locomotive would be involved in a wreck and was presumably scrapped, with no other information on this unique engine. Central Pacific No. 63 Leviathan running from Chicago to Galesburg In June of 2015, the Leviathan, or Central Pacific 63, was presented at Galesburg Railroad Days of the Year with the creator of the replica, David Cloak, as the engineer. We have 765's Gelberg excursion mentioned, but there aren't any records of the little 440 moving on its own between the two cities, so the excursion portion of the century is highly doubted, and was likely transported by truck, or as this photo suggests, pulled by a BNSF Chivo as part of a freight move. A second cab forward being preserved. Rumors have circulated that the Southern Pacific was going to preserve a second cab forward, but due to issues with the group who owned Southern Pacific 410-250-21 at the time, the SP backed out and ended up scrapping it. This has raised some questions, as railfan photographer and historian Chard Walker reports that the Southern Pacific's president at the time, Mr. Russell, was intended on scrapping every single cab forward, and the group who ultimately saved 4294 from being cut up at the last minute had to fight tooth and nail to get Southern Pacific to save and donate it to them. CNO and NW merger circa 1960. For years, the NNW and CNO were hard rivals, not surprisingly, because they were both coal centered Appalachian roads specifically concentrated in Western Virginia and West Virginia. Rather than fight it out, the CNO and NNW decided to merge in 1965 to end this rivalry. The boards of both roads approved the merger on August 31, 1965. This proposal called for the creation of the subsidiary Derrico to take control of the DNH, EL, BNM, Reading, and CNJ. On October 11, 1965, the NNW and CNO applied to merge and it went to the ICC. Sadly, the ICC declined it and the merger never came to fruition. Montana Rail Link 390 This is an expansion to the number of existing F-45s. This locomotive originally started as Burlington Northern 6644 and was acquired by Montana Rail Link then in the 1990s until being retired in 2007. Dynamic Rail in Washington was trying to save Montana Rail Link 390 from scrap in the 2010s when Montana Rail Link announced their plan to scrap the last two remaining F-45s on their roster. Their fundraising campaign failed, however a private individual stepped in at the 11th hour and saved the 390. Where it is and what the owner has planned for it as of when this video was made is still unknown. Silver Creek and Stevenson's Nickel Plate Alco Switcher In the 2000s, the Nickel Plate Historical Society reported that the Silver Creek and Stevenson Tourist Railroad in Freeport, Illinois was attempting to acquire former Nickel Plate Alco Switcher No. 4, which had been working at St. Mary's Supplant Plant up until then. This is already some 10 to 15 years ago and there is no sign of an Alco Switcher ever being moved to Freeport. Where it is now and why it hasn't been moved to Freeport are a mystery, but it is most likely still sitting at the abandoned plant. Lost railroad networks that were planned but never built. A custom Google Maps titled Abandoned and Out of Service Railroad Lines provides a few examples of lines which were planned but never constructed, along with thousands of other lines which were abandoned. One of these unbuilt lines is between Breezewood and Huston Town, Pennsylvania. Originally built for the South Pennsylvania Railroad, which itself was never built, the tunnels that were part of the original Pennsylvania Turnpike proved to be insufficient for vehicle traffic, and are thus a part of one of the longest stretches of abandoned road in the country. 
There are a lot more, and I would recommend taking a look at some of them. All of them are under the category Unbuilt or Unused Railroad Lines, which is identified through black lines. A Preserved United Aircraft Turbotrain When I first saw this, my initial reaction was, We have a preserved USE Turbotrain! Let's go! But then I found further information regarding the topic and found that an issue of Trains Magazine from many years ago stated that a United Aircraft Turbo Train had been offered for preservation, but was turned down by the museum that it was offered to. I know it's an unreliable model, but it still would have been great to see one of those in preservation. The Sole Surviving Illinois Central GP7 the sole surviving Illinois Central GP7 is with Watco and renumbered to 7008. Originally, it was built as Illinois Central 8951 and it was built in March of 1951. It would serve under the Illinois Central banner before being bought by the Meridian and Big B Railroad as their number 103 in 1964. The locomotive would later be rebuilt by Paducah in 1976, but it was still classified as a GP7U instead of a GP8 or GP11. 103 would stay with the railroad before being bought by ISC Incorporated and eventually Watco as WAMX 7008. It was moved to Coffeyville, Kansas where it stayed there and probably will stay there out in the public. Or since there's never been any new photos of the locomotive since 2015, it is likely stored there as to this day. Since the locomotive has been identified as a GP7U to this day, this locomotive could very well be the last original Illinois Central GP7 left in existence. The Union Pacific Railroad Company which built the Transcontinental Railroad is not the same one that exists today the original one going bankrupt in the 1900s. During the Panic of 1893, which screwed up a lot of things for America, disbanding so many 19th century railroads, the original Union Pacific Railroad, THE Union Pacific Railroad that built the Transcontinental Railroad out of Omaha, Nebraska, fell victim to this disastrous event. The Union Pacific had to declare bankruptcy during the event and afterwards, it was reinvigorated as the Union Pacific Railroad, a completely different railroad than what it was in the 1860s when it was linking up the American West and was completed on a hot early May 1869 day with the driving of the signature Golden Spike. However, the Union Pacific was technically four different companies since the original's formation in 1862, with the most recent one, Mark II, having started in 1969 and was renamed to Union Pacific after the railroad's merger of the Southern Pacific. This could mean that the Union Pacific that we know today is in fact none other than the Southern Pacific. What's for lunch tomorrow? This is the biggest unknown in the rail fanning community. What could this simple phrase possibly mean? What deeper meaning could there be? Well, as the ultimate finale to this iceberg, and after spending hours and days of nearly endless research, I finally found the explanation. And quite honestly, it's pretty shocking. The true meaning of what's for lunch tomorrow is... <laughs> Still very much unknown. You can't predict what you're going to have for lunch tomorrow. You may get something simple like cold pizza straight from the refrigerator or microwaving a container of ramen. Or who knows, they may go all out professional, making a simple midday meal seem like dinner. Having a four course meal of the most exquisite lunch meals, like garlic sticks with carrots and chips. For me, I usually try to find a local restaurant or pizzeria to grab a quick lunch before going back out rail fanning. And with that, we reach the end of the American Railroad Iceberg. Thank you all for watching this video going through the depths of the expansive history of US railroading. Now I do acknowledge that there is already a video on this iceberg in particular by Grand Drunk Western, which I will leave a link in the description. This video was uploaded while I was making the script for this one, and I asked if I should continue with my own since I could provide more information on most of the topics which he didn't find much info for, to which he allowed. At the same time, Seaboard Railfan stated interest in covering the topic for a future video. Since I didn't want to steal the topic of another channel for a video which hasn't been uploaded yet, 
I asked if we could work on this project together to avoid duplicate videos and to combine our knowledge of the subject. He agreed to this concept, and the rest is history. A big thank you to Thorax to Railfan for creating this masterpiece, allowing me to make a video on it, and for providing very helpful information for these topics. Thank you all for watching. Credit for all the photos used go to their respective photographers, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Have a good day.